In this video, I'm going to teach you how to solve gas stoichiometry problems in which the gas is collected by a method called water displacement. This is an example of a type of water displacement apparatus. They don't all look exactly like this, but this is the general idea. Water displacement apparatus contains two different components. One is um, where the chemical reaction is actually taking place. And then the other component is where the gas is being collected via water displacement. Let's start by talking about the chemical reaction part first. This particular reaction requires heat, so it is being done over the top of a Bunsen burner. The reaction in this situation is being done inside a test tube. It doesn't have to be a test tube, it could be a flask. Regardless, whatever type of glassware you're using to contain the reaction, the glassware has to be closed on top. So this has got like a stopper or something inside of it, and this is to keep the gas from escaping into the environment. Then we have this hollow tubing that runs from the reaction into the water part of the water displacement um, tech, uh, apparatus. This contains two components. One is just an open tub that is full of water or mostly full of water. This could be a large beaker as well. Um, or when we do this in the lab, we just use very large plastic tubs. The second component that we have in here is an upside down graduated cylinder. This could also be an upside down jar or an upside down large beaker. It's upside down, meaning that this is the bottom of the graduated cylinder. So this is the closed portion of the graduated cylinder. And then this down here is the top or the mouth or the opening of the graduated cylinder. So this is the open end and our tubing runs from the reaction up into this upside down bottle or graduated cylinder or whatever it might be. In addition, this graduated cylinder or bottle or whatever it is has been previously filled up with water. So it's got water in it all the way up to the top. This whole entire thing is full of water, which um, is being indicated by my light blue shading here. So the idea is that as this reaction takes place inside the test tube and the chemical reaction that we're using in this example is the decomposition of potassium chlorate. So we have this potassium chlorate sample in here being heated up and as it heats up, it turns into potassium chloride and oxygen gas. The oxygen gas that is generated by this reaction fills up the test tube. And when it gets to the top of the test tube, remember this test tube is closed so it can't escape. It travels through this tubing, this hollow tubing, and travels through the tubing, does not escape the tubing, up into this upside down graduated cylinder um, where it comes out the other end of the tubing and it begins to fill up the graduated cylinder. As the gas molecules fill up this area of the graduated cylinder, they begin, to, they begin to displace the water inside this graduated cylinder. So I'm just gonna to try to erase some of this water. So the gas molecules are coming up and they're occupying this particular space. And as they do that, they displace some of the water that's inside the graduated cylinder. And so we end up with all of our gas molecules filling up this space up here. Once the reaction is complete, we're going to be able to use information about the amount of gas that's filled up the top of this graduated cylinder to solve the problem um, that's being asked of us. Now, before we jump into the actual problem, what I'd like to do is take the data from this problem here and just kind of fill it into this apparatus so we've got kind of a better picture of what we're looking at. So I'm just gonna go through the problem and write the data into this picture as we come across it. We have O2 gas that's being collected by water displacement, that's this method here. So that means that I know up here in this space we have O2 gas, that's the gas that is being generated. I'm gonna label that. And our temperature is at 295. That applies to this, the temperature of the gas inside the graduated cylinder. Not this area over here. The presence of the Bunsen burner means that this area right here is very hot, but over here where the gas is being collected, it's 295 Kelvin. The volume of oxygen gas collected is 0.65 liters. So what they, uh, how they get that number is they just measure literally the volume of space that has been emptied or displaced with the gas. That's why using a graduated cylinder is a really handy tool for this because as you know, graduated cylinders, they have volume markings on them. So it makes it really easy for us to read 
how much space is being occupied by the gas. Of course, the numbers are all going to be upside down because the graduated cylinder is upside down, but we are still able to read it. So this volume in this situation is 0 0.650 liters. And again, that's going to be the volume of the empty space in the graduated cylinder. So it also says that atmospheric pressure is 0.992 atmospheres. That's the pressure in this area around here. Atmospheric pressure is 0.992 atm. And that is referring to the pressure that is pushing down on the, the water that's inside this open tub, which is helping to regulate the pressure inside our upside down graduated cylinder as well. So the pressure of 0.992, because this is an open system, it applies to the gas that's inside the graduated cylinder, and it also applies just to the gas in general um, in the atmosphere in this reaction. And again, that is true only because this is a completely open system. The vapor pressure of water at 295 Kelvin is 0 0.072 atm. So the vapor pressure is a new word. We haven't used that yet in any of the videos. Vapor pressure is a type of partial pressure. So we can think about it as just simply being the partial pressure of water. The vapor pressure specifically is the pressure of a gas over the surface of its liquid. So vapor pressure of water is referring to the partial pressure of water over the surface of water. So when we have an open container of water like this one, we have a little bit of water in the gas phase up above that liquid water and we refer to the amount of gaseous water as the vapor pressure of water. So we have a little bit of water molecules that have evaporated uh, up above this tub of water, which is kind of a non-issue to us. We also have some water molecules that have evaporated above the surface inside the graduated cylinder. That's a bigger deal to us. So we have a vapor pressure of water, little bit of water gas um, up in this area right here, and the vapor pressure of water at this particular at these particular conditions, 295 Kelvin is 0 0.027 atm. So what we've learned from that little piece of information is that in addition to having oxygen gas inside this space, we also have some H2O gas in this space as well. Not very much. And the pressure of that H2O gas is 0 0.027 atmospheres. So we have, like I said, we have a lot of information here. Um, the way that we are going to approach this problem, because again, this is a stoichiometry problem, and our goal is to calculate the initial mass of potassium chlorate. So let's write down our objective here. The mass of KClO3 is what we're trying to figure out. In stoichiometry problems in general, we're going to get to that grams of KClO3 by figuring out the moles of KClO3. That's, that's going to be like basically the last step that we take before we figure out how many grams there are. So we need to know how many moles of KClO3 we have. And because this is a stoichiometry problem, the way that we're going to get that number, the way we'll figure out moles of KClO3 is by figuring out the moles of either KCl or O2. Now this problem doesn't tell us anything at all about KCl. It's not listed anywhere. So we have no information about KCl. We do have quite a bit of information about oxygen gas. So that's a big hint that we need to figure out how many moles of oxygen gas we have. If we know how many moles of oxygen gas we have, we can use the balanced chemical equation to relate moles of O2 into moles of KClO3 and then the molar mass from moles to grams. So our goal is to figure out how many moles of oxygen we have. And because oxygen is a gas, we can get that by using PV equals NRT. So if we say for any gas, PV equals NRT, rearrange it, the number of moles of any gas, like in this case oxygen, the number of moles of oxygen gas is going to come from the pressure of that gas times the volume of that gas divided by the gas constant and the temperature of that gas. I lost a, I lost a little O subscript here. So the pressure of oxygen gas times the volume of the oxygen gas divided by the gas constant R and the temperature of the oxygen gas. If we know the pressure and the volume and the temperature of the oxygen gas, we can use all of that to solve for the moles of oxygen. 
Now, looking back um, at all of these variables, trying to identify them from or match them up with variables that we have over here in our diagram, one thing that we know for sure with our oxygen gas is that it, at, it is at a temperature of 295 Kelvin. So the problem has given us that information. I feel very confident about that. So we definitely know this number. We also know it tells us the volume of the gas in this space right here um, is 0.65 liters. So we know the volume of gas as well. Now you might be wondering, hey, wait a minute. This, we said this contains both H2O as well as O2. Um, so is it fair to say that the volume of oxygen is 0.65? Um, yes, it is. In general, in a gas, as a rule, if you have a mixture of gases, the total volume of the container is the volume of anything inside it. So the 0.65, that's the volume of the O2 because the O2 is occupying this whole entire space, not just part of it. And 0.65 is also the volume of the H2O because the H2O gas is allowed to occupy this whole space. It's not allowed to just take up one little part. So since the O2 gas molecules can spread out over this whole entire 0 0.650 liters, that is the volume of our O2. The only thing we really don't know for sure is the pressure of the O2. We have been given the pressure of the water, gas, and we've been given the pressure of the atmosphere and the pressure of the area in general, but we don't know what the pressure is of water or O2. So we're gonna need to use Dalton's law of partial pressure to help us figure this out. Dalton's law of partial pressure says that the total pressure of all of the gases in a mixture is due to the sum of the partial pressures of the gases in the mixture. In this problem, our gases in the mixture, right up here, are oxygen gas and H2O gas. The total pressure in this space right here is equal to the partial pressure of the O2 and the partial pressure of the H2O. We know the total pressure, it's 0.992 in units of atmospheres, which I'm going to leave off. We don't know the pressure of the O2. We know the pressure of the H2O, 0 0.027 atmospheres. So from this, we can solve for the pressure of the O2, and it is 0.965 atmospheres. So this is the last piece of information that we need to be able to apply, plug everything into PV equals NRT. And I am actually going to, because I'm going to run out of room here, I'm just going to shrink this up a little bit and I'm going to try to stick it over here. So what we're going to do now is take all of our variables and we're going to plug them into the ideal gas law to solve for the number of moles of O2. The pressure, which we just calculated using um, Dalton's law of partial pressures. And uh, another thing I'm going to do to save space is I'm going to leave units off of the ideal gas equation just to, to save space. The volume, which is 0 0.650, the ideal gas constant, 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres mole Kelvin, and the temperature, 295 Kelvin. It's really important that we have all of these units right. And again, I've left the units off in here just because they take up a lot of space and I don't have a lot of space left. Um, but the result of this, the number of moles of O2 is 0 0.026. This is definitely the hardest and most unfamiliar part of solving this type of problem, using the ideal gas law to come up with the moles of O2. This calculating the partial pressure of the gas is probably the trickiest part. Just remembering that you have to, to use partial pressure, use the vapor pressure of water and the external pressure to get the pressure of the O2. Another thing that I see that students do commonly mistake is this concept that the volume, the total volume here is the volume of the oxygen gas and it's also the volume of the H2O gas as well. The H2O gas is allowed to occupy this whole space and the O2 gas is allowed to occupy the whole space as well, which I understand is kind of a tricky concept. So once we get here to moles of O2, this is, this is where we're at right now. We know this number. Now this becomes a much more straightforward stoichiometry problem. We're going to take the moles of O2 that we calculated using the ideal gas law, we are going to multiply by a conversion factor 
that cancels out units of moles of O2 and converts into units of moles KClO3, which is the thing that we're trying to solve for in this problem. And this is like, this is a basic stoichiometry problem. So now we're just using the mole to mole ratio from the balanced equation, three moles of O2 for every two moles of KClO3. That is going to give us the number of moles of KClO3. That's not exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for the mass of KClO3. So we've got to do one more step here. And this last step is to convert out of units of moles KClO3 and to convert into units of grams KClO3. And we'll do that using the, mol the molar mass of KClO3, which is 123 grams per mole. This works to out to be about 2.1 grams of KClO3. A lot of steps involved in this problem. Um, so there's a lot of things to keep straight. Make sure you just write everything down. I find it to be very helpful to label a diagram that helps me keep, keep track of all of my variables. Um, but like I said, once you get to this part, the rest of it is pretty straightforward.